How much does a candidate need the backing of the establishment to stand a chance of winning and to say you do, but if you were to go and go up against the establishment, these are the three things you need to stand a chance to win. Yeah. What would you say to that? I, I have never had the establishment's backing, not when I ran for state office yeah. or uh, city council or when I ran for Congress. I was never the obvious choice from a party or an establishment standpoint. And frankly, even had some people in the Hawaii Democratic Party who were uh, actively opposing uh, my my candidacy. And so I was shocked when, when a couple of weeks after I was sworn in as a member of Congress, I got a call saying, do you want to be vice chair of the DNC? Like I had no insight into the establishment organizations. And literally my response was, I don't know. What does a vice chair of the DNC do? What are you really asking of me? But said yes, because I, I said, okay, well, here's an opportunity to try to, to bring about some reforms that would actually ensure the Democratic Party is truly democratic and listening to, and connected to uh, the people. And perhaps a little too idealistic as I went through that, but really my eyes being opened into the fact that, well, this party is actually has become a party of elites, uh, serving the interests of the elites and not the interests of the people who they are supposed to be, uh, whose cause they are supposed to be championing. And so so back back to your question, I, I resigned as vice chair of the DNC specifically because of what was going on in that 2016 primary and, and specifically related to foreign policy. Bernie and I don't agree on every issue, but on foreign policy, we had a situation in 2016 where Hillary Clinton was being touted as, <clears throat> excuse me, the most qualified candidate ever to run for president in the history of our country. All of the talking heads on television use that line almost every single day. And yet they did not talk about what her record actually was. The, the stream of destruction and war and toppled regimes and failed states and dead bodies that she left in her wake. They refused to have her even answer, uh, you know, basic questions about that record not in debate stages, not in interviews. And frankly, Bernie Sanders wasn't even bringing it up that much when in fact that was one of the biggest differences. I mean, he has a, a, a largely non-interventionist leaning foreign policy. I resigned as vice chair of the DNC uh, and endorsed him specifically on foreign policy to uh, maximize whatever platform I could uh, have to shine a light on that contrast, on that difference, and uh, and expose Hillary's foreign policy record and hold her accountable um, uh, to it. About can you can you be successful in politics without the establishment support? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is it the easiest path? Is it the shortest path? No. But if your interest is in uh, remaining committed to the people of this country or the people of your constituency or of your district, that's where my focus has always been. Uh, and unfortunately, we are living in a time where the establishment interest is not the interest of the people. So if you want to go play the insider politics game, the establishment game, uh, it, you'll, you'll, go, you'll go places. It comes at a very, very high cost. Uh, Going up against them. It, it, it even comes at a high cost of personal compromise and a compromise of integrity if you choose to play that game. And yes, going up and challenging them is not just challenging the DNC or the Democratic Party. Right. It is also challenging all of their partners in the mainstream corporate media, challenging uh, elements of the national security state that they are weaponizing for their own interests, challenging their friends and partners in big tech and social media who are very willing to do their bidding. So it is this whole kind of cabal of elitism that benefits off of having people in positions of power that they can control. And that's where, as you said, people were talking about me a lot at one point, but once they realize, oh, okay, she's not falling for the glitter and right. things that were dangling in front of her and she thinks for herself and uh, it, it, it speaks her own mind, uh, that's, where, that's where the tables uh, kind of started to turn. And, you know, I stopped getting invited to the, the parties and the stuff that Damn. I know, Some right? Good <laughs> what, what are the, he says it comes at a cost. Yeah being purchased by uh, the establishment. What does that mean exactly? Like in terms of I've your credibility? I've, just seen it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it in friends of mine, people who, uh, who came in uh, with the best of intentions 
and maybe throughout still maintain the best of intentions and didn't really realize, you know, in, in the, in the best sense of the word, didn't realize how, okay, well, I'll just do this in order to get this done, or I'll just do that in order to get, I'll compromise this or that or whatever. Um, and, and not really realize that they were losing themselves in the process. And I've also, I also know those who are very blatant about it. Like, yeah, I will in a very calculating way, do anything that is required in order to get myself to this position or this title or, or hold this, this amount what, what of a life, power. Though. They're going to hold you hostage if you exactly. do that. Exactly. And I've gonna, seen it. I've seen it on the house yeah. floor during votes, people being chased down. Now, if you, if you, if you do that, if you play that game, they've got leverage over you vote for this or else. If you don't support us, we're going to take away this money. So it's a threatening take... environment. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so let's, but let's stay on this. So for example, the, the prop, we had Whitney Webb here uh, yesterday or two days ago, three days, Thursday. something like that. And we had Whit Whitney Thursday. Webb here and she wrote a couple books going up against, you know, Epstein and a bunch of different Lex and all these guys. He, she's very good at what she does. And one of the questions I asked her, which has prompted a lot of discussion the last couple of days, is, so all these establishments, okay, who is establishment? Like right now, if we were to say, who's the chairman of the board of the establishment party? Of course, it's not a party. Who would you yeah. say is the chairman of the board at the top? Mm. Hillary Clinton. Okay. You put her ahead of uh, Obama. Oh, yeah. Oh, so she is still ahead of Obama for establishment. Who do you put on the board? Like, if you were to you say, because you look at who who was who was, uh, you know, even though they were up against each other in two thousand eight, I mean, you look at the people who populated the Obama administration, Hillary, Hillary Clinton right. being Secretary of State, and you look at the people who are populating the Biden administration. Who's his National Security Council director? Jake Sullivan, who is Hillary Clinton's right hand guy. Got it. So you put her. So you don't you don't subscribe to this mindset that Obama's really on his third term and he's running the country. That's not where you're at. I think he is. I think he is playing a very impactful role. But uh, Hillary Clinton uh, spent decades still building that Clinton machine. So she's that deep. is still very much. Okay. You think she still plays a role in the Biden administration? Yes. So Hillary. here's a question. Yes. So here's a question. Here's a question. So if that's the case, to go up. Is the goal in order for America to be free to go up against establishment, expose them, replace them with people that are statesmen and hold them accountable? Would you say that should be one of American voters' top goals? It is the essential objective. We're on the same page. So now he, this goes. Uh, can I add one little thing? Of course. To that? Sure. It is because you look at. Um, and I talked a little bit about this in my talk yesterday about when you look at the words that the founders used in our founding documents, we the people, uh, a self-governed nation, we are the ones who have the ability to make this change. It feels hopeless at times because of how much money and power and all of these machines that are that exist to maintain that status quo of power. But ultimately at the ballot box, we are the ones who have the power to make the kind of change you're talking about and hold these elected leaders accountable and... They need to be people of courage who have the backbone and the strength to completely clean out the administrative state, the bureaucrats who have their own agenda uh, and who are very willing to either uh, undermine the direction and interests of the people that we elect, the president of the United States, uh, and... and uh, continue to thrive off of this revolving, this corrupt revolving door uh, that exists between special interests and those who are unelected, uh, yet who are making the kinds of changes through rules and regulations that should be done legislatively. Title IX is one example of this. Perfect. We're going the right direction. We're on the same page there. I agree with you. But I think, you know, the challenge then becomes the following. If you look at all the establishment and as well as some of these institutions that have made our lives horrible since November of, you know, 1963 till today. Let's go 63 till today, November 22nd assassination, John F. Kennedy. So I'm purely going November 1st till today. You can add uh, FBI, CIA. You can put in there DOJ, military industrial complex. You can, you know, Whitney talked about the big tech firms. She put IBM, but she put all the social media companies. She put Pritzker, the, the folks from Big Pharma, lobbyists, you said Fed, right? We went through all the, and then names, Mainstream Clinton, media. Biden, you know, there were names from both sides, left and the right. Okay. When you think about who in the last 60 years 
that has had the weight to go up against these guys, you have to look at who was hated the most by those institutions and organizations and establishment. Kennedy was hated by those guys because they were on their way to want to undermine them. And another guy named Donald was, Mm -hmm. right? So obviously on two opposite Mm -hmm. sides, one guy was a Second Amendment guy in 1963, John F. Kennedy. They were NRA card members. Today, I'm not sure he would have been a Democrat today. Maybe he would have been a libertarian, independent, possibly a center-right type of Mm -hmm. a position he would have been today. But to go up against these guys that a lot of people think they're evil, okay, the, the, when you look at, you know, we'll go into this as well with the whole ESG, DEI, CEI stuff. We'll go into that afterwards. But the person to go up against the establishment, how does the average voter be able to tell the difference on who that candidate is? Because whoever has the guts and the ability and the willingness and is a true believer to do that, every institution is going to pin him as a bad guy or bad girl. Yeah. They're not going to market this person as a good candidate. They're going to have to do whatever they can to do character assassination. So how does the voter see between that massive character assassination and saying, but I think this is the guy or this is the gal that can do the job. How do we differentiate between the two? People's trust in the mainstream media has radic- radically, radically been uh, reduced over time. I, I think it's at, it's probably at a historic low at this point. Uh, people's trust in our public institutions has continued to drop. Why? Because we have been lied to and cheated and uh, evidence has been shown how corrupt these entities have unfortunately become. So I think, how do we know? I think the first question is if you have, uh, you know, often the mainstream media, they end up parroting all of the same talking points. When they're saying the very same thing, about someone like, oh, this is the best person who's ever come along. They are going to come and save the country. Me? I'd be like, well, I don't know. I'm going to dig deeper into that person. This seems kind of suspicious. And in my case, you know, I've, they parrot the same talking points and accusations and baseless smears against me. I have heard from people who are saying, hey, I've heard them saying all this stuff about you. Doesn't seem right. I want to learn more. So I think, I think identifying the messenger uh, and uh, being able to see through that facade of lies, or it's not a facade of lies, they are actually lies, but seeing through that facade uh, to recognize the truth or at least uh, the need to dig deeper to learn more, I think is is where uh, we're moving in that direction. And I think we're also seeing evidence of this with people migrating more towards new media, podcasts like yours, shows like yours and others who... Uh, you know, where, where they can actually gain real information and they know they're not being fed like a sound bite by sound mm. bite, um, you know, a sheet of lies. What do you think about Trump or DeSantis as a candidate? Uh, tell me more. What do you mean? I mean, okay, so let's just say you are somebody that um, you're the Soros of the right. There isn't one, but let's just say you're the Soros of the right. The Soros of the left. He is helping these guys out in ways that if you're on the left, you have to send this guy a Valentine's Day card, a, it doesn't matter, Memorial Day card. He's never served, but you got to tell him thank you for your service if you're a Democrat. <laughs> He's that guy, right? Uh, on the right, there's not really one there. They, you know, they, they think they are, but they're not really there. They claim they want to make the investment. They're not going to cut the check and buy Vice and buy Time Magazine and buy New York Times or LA Times and they buy Forbes. It was just on sale somebody else. They're just not willing to put the money there. They right. kind of want to go live in Palm Beach, have a nice place, and be left alone and just kind of go have drinks and do whatever they want to do. Mm-hmm. It's unfortunate because they're not fighters once they make their money. The Dems are more fighters and true believers. A lot of times Republican billionaires talk more than they actually do the fighting. Right. So, But let's just say you are that person, okay? And you're a center-right person with a lot of money. And you have the ability to get behind a candidate that's willing to fight against the establishment. Where would you put Trump, DeSantis, or even others as a qualified candidate to go up against this task? It's going to be an ugly one. Who would you say is the most qualified to do that job? Um, I don't. I don't know. Is is the honest answer? Um, I, I don't know enough about all the different people who are running. Uh, Trump has obviously shown he he has taken on both 
you know, all of, all of the establishments, you know, obviously the Democrats, the Republican mm-hmm. party, the media. And I, I think that's one reason why a lot of people are drawn to him is, is, um, he says what a lot of people are thinking in some ways, even if it's not nice to hear, uh, but is willing to, to kind of take on these, these machines that have been perceived to be too powerful, uh, to take on. And I think, I think Ron DeSantis has done that in some ways, but, um, I, I think it remains it remains to be seen. And I think that's the beauty of this this election process is that voters will have the time and the opportunity as they should, both for Republicans and Democrats and, and with the DNC's decision to uh, not allow Democratic voters to have that opportunity is truly offensive and disrespectful. Uh, to voters. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.